Megan is a leader of Natural Capital and Environmental Markets Initiative, and she'll be introducing the topic of environmental markets. Please make very welcome Megan Burkett. Hey, hello, and thank you for having me today. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet, the Wiradjuri people, and also pay my respects to their elders past and present. So yes, I'm Megan Burkett from the Natural Capital and Environmental Markets Initiative. And the purpose of this session is to introduce environmental markets as a framing for the environmental markets section of today's conversation. So, I'm not getting my slides moving. Oh, yeah. Okay, looks good. All right. So, uh, in doing so, there's three key messages I'd like to focus on for you. The first is to introduce environmental markets and why there are growing opportunities, and we've heard a little bit about that already from Catherine. The second is to introduce a range of environmental market approaches. And the third, I'll explain why I think it's really important that landholders participate in environmental markets as leaders and as innovators and entrepreneurs and why landholders are in a really good position to do this and how this will benefit you and wider society. Okay, so first key message. What are environmental markets and why are there growing opportunities? So I like to start, before we get into that, with just what is a market? So a market in this context is where parties exchange goods and services for money or other things of value. And most of you are already involved in a whole range of markets, meat and livestock markets, grain markets, fruit and vegetable markets, everyday markets where we buy our, where we buy our food and fuel, property markets. So building on this then, what is an environmental market? An environmental market is where parties exchange that same money or things of value, but for environmental goods and services. So the same as those other markets we just talked about, but here we're exchanging environmental goods and services. And environmental goods and services are things like natural assets, or the natural assets and resources on your property. So soil, water, forests, wildlife, things you know about. And ecosystem services are the services we derive from nature such as energy from the sun, land and conditions for producing food, water storage and filtration, and climate regulation. And then there's environmental services. Now, we define environmental services as the activities or management actions that people like yourselves do to protect, manage, restore, or enhance nature. So healthy soil and water management protecting critical habitat, controlling invasive weeds and pests, and there's other, there's other environmental services up here. So now, you may already know these activities as just on-farm management activities, or that's natural resource management, or that's sustainable land management. But the term environmental services helps to reframe these activities and acknowledge the need, the role, the cost and benefit of these services in the context of natural capital in addition to their on-farm role. Okay. So how is an environmental market created? At its simplest, an environmental market is created where there are parties willing to produce, supply or sell environmental goods and services these might be landholders, land managers, farmers, so many of you here today. Or it could be you in the future. And when there are these parties willing to fund, to buy and invest in these things. 
So these can be a whole range of parties, individuals, consumers, whole towns, businesses and industries, government and wider society. So the environmental market is that mechanism for this exchange to occur. Now, of course, the amount of money or the thing of value that people are willing to exchange depends on a whole range of factors just like traditional markets. So it might be the benefits they receive from natural capital, the quality of the natural capital or services, could be scarcity, policy and legislation, supply requirements, a whole range of other factors. Now, an environmental market can be a bit more complex, like regulated carbon markets um, and biodiversity markets, or an environmental market can be as simple as two individuals making a private exchange. And I really want to highlight that latter point again. So an environmental market can be as simple as two individuals making a private exchange. So we heard from Catherine that there's growing demand for environmental markets from both sides. So for landholders, there's a range of reasons why environmental markets are beneficial. So it could be to fund stewardship, uh, it could be to create new revenue streams, diversify your income streams, access finance, offset your costs, meet your supplier needs, and there's other motivations as well. And these reasons are really unique for each landholder. They're unique for you. Um, and getting clear on your motivations will really make it easier to decide which opportunities to pursue. But there's also growing demand from that buyer side, from the funder side, the investor side. So we heard that there's these growing markets for sustainable goods and services, increasing demand for carbon and biodiversity, increasing demand for sustainable supply chains, and this policy and legislation that is and will continue to emerge. So in response, of course, environmental market opportunities are growing for you. Okay, so second key message, what are the environmental market opportunities available? And I'm going to take really quite a broad view of this. And the reason I want to do that is so that you have a more holistic understanding of what exists and what is possible. And I guess the way that I like to come at this is to think about in what ways can you use markets in general to enable that environmental market exchange we just talked about. And here are some of these ways. And I hope that for many of you, um, there's a lot more than what you might have originally thought. So let's go through this quickly. So firstly, we've got business strategies. So this is where you can pursue um, to create value or gain an advantage in commodity or other markets that you operate in from your sustainability or environmental performance. So adding price premiums or accessing new markets that are looking for sustainable goods and services. Cost-saving approaches. So this is where your land management or business costs might reduce by investing in natural capital. So drought-proofing now might save you money in the future and money overall. So asset value is where your assets, such as your property, your business, or you might have shares as part of your business, increase in value as a result of the improvements in your natural capital on your property. So finance relates to financial products and mechanisms that reward those benefits. Uh, trading refers to those regulated and private trading schemes, so things like your carbon markets, your biodiversity markets, um, cap and trade schemes and others. Taxes, levies and charges. Um, so this is where they can be imposed on you for environmental reasons. And in this case, your natural capital may help you to avoid those things. And then finally, we've got incentive payments where investing in natural capital and environmental services may increase your eligibility for rebates, funding and grants. Um, now, that's a lot. And, and you don't need to be proficient in all of these approaches. But I do really think it's important for you to be aware of these approaches so that you can consider all of your options more broadly and holistically and then decide which one is going to work for you. Okay, so we can see that currently there are a whole range of market opportunities available 
And in today's conversations following from me, you're going to learn more about carbon markets, biodiversity markets, sustainable finance. You've already heard about ESG and we'll hear some more. Price premiums, incentive payments. But beyond the already established markets, I'd like to invite you to think about the broader possibilities. So you see, the beauty of markets is that markets are created by people. They're created by us here today and others, which means we are not limited by what currently exists. Oh, gone too far. So I invite you on your lunch break or on your way home to think about this. What natural assets what ecosystem services, what environmental services exist on your property. And if you're still learning those terms and what they mean, come and see me at the lunch break and I'll talk you through them. Who benefits from them? And how do they benefit? What value do they place on these benefits? And which of these market approaches we just went through could recognise and enable a market exchange and help you to continue to manage and enhance your natural capital and farm? All right, third and final message, and I'll try and speed this one up for your timing. Great. Okay, this is probably my most important message, for me personally, anyway. Landholders and regional communities are critical stakeholders in environmental markets. And I think it's really important and valuable for landholders and regional communities to really understand environmental markets, to feel confident to participate and beyond that, beyond participating and understanding, I think it's important for landholders and regional communities more broadly to be able to lead in this space, to be able to innovate in this space, and to be entrepreneurial. Now, why? Why do I think this? Markets aren't inherently good or bad. They are what we make them and what we allow them to become. Markets can be really beneficial. So they can create new opportunities, new jobs, they can support regional economic stability, resilience, prosperity, and in the case of environmental markets, they can fund sustainable land management and farming goals. But markets can also fail. They can be monopolised and they can be harmful. So because of this, I think local landholders and regional communities like Wagga Wagga, the wider Riverina region will benefit from really engaging with and influencing how natural capital and environmental markets evolve so that the people controlling and influencing environmental markets are local landholders, local businesses and local communities. So that the wealth and the benefits created by environmental markets are reinvested back into your region. And so that ultimately, environmental markets are working to your advantage, to the advantage of your local community, and really importantly, to the advantage of the environment itself. Now, landholders and land managers are really well positioned to lead, to innovate, and to come up with new market ideas. Why is this? Why are you in this good position? Why do I think you are? So many of you already understand and engage in other markets. You get markets. You already understand and engage in business and entrepreneurial practice, practices. You're likely to own or manage natural capital already. You're likely to already be delivering environmental services. And you seek to gain financial, social and other benefits from these exchanges. So you already hold a lot of the keys for what you need. And finally, for those of you that want to, how can you start? Here's a few options for you. So continue to build your knowledge, skills and networks and today is a really great way to start. Share your ideas and insights with, um, with your peers. Apply new practices on farm. Sign up for pilots, sign up for trials, explore your existing markets. Provide input to policy and regulatory design and advocate to your peers, government and non-government organisations for what is needed. And the last two, and uh, more importantly, is to ideate new market opportunities. 
What market opportunities do you need? And bring them to life. And of course, you can speak to your local LLS advisor for support. Thanks very much. Thank you, Megan. Thank you for such a professional presentation that was so well articulated and so well explained through your slides. Um, thank you so much.